This is Christmas week and I'm often asked by people if I really believe Christmas happened on December 25th because they've read things that cause them to believe there's a different Christmas story factually than the one that we're told that is celebrated this week. So there's a lot of things about the Christmas story that are unknown the date just being a small part of that. So I gathered some different pieces of the story that probably aren't known. And I am going to share them. They're the ones that were probably more significant to me, but that I felt were important that people understood. This story, the Christmas story, the coming of Jesus to the earth, is so multifaceted it is so um the the span of time that this story was being written went back preceding the earth that story was well in motion before man was ever created so it's not something that just happened on a specific day it was a very long story that was moving from the beginning. But I'm going to share some facts around that event that are kind of surprising. <laughs> when you think about the story that you know, it's more surprising, far more surprising. And so um, I will give my sources in the notes at the end. So um, for those of us who grew up celebrating the birth of Christ, which I think is fairly common in America, um, Christmas is, is everybody's holiday, whether you believe in Jesus or not. Christmas is very commercialized, but originally I think everyone agrees it goes back to the birth of Christ as the origin. But it becomes a really familiar story. It's just another very familiar story and it doesn't attach to people because it's just a familiar story that doesn't attach to anyone's personal life. And it slips from being the incredible story that it is to just a factual event that happened in history and people can rattle off the events about Mary giving birth to Jesus, shepherds and wise men came to visit them. It was just an easy, short story that we can read in a children's book. But when you really look at what happened around that event, it is anything but normal. It's actually very absurd in many ways. It's full of biological impossibility, strained family dynamics, emotional turmoil, supernatural encounters, a failed assassination attempt, and people asked to do things that are so crazy that it's a wonder that they got through it. When you think, have you ever seen a pencil maker become a pencil? Or have you ever seen an airplane maker become an airplane? That's how crazy this story is because no one else can accomplish what Jesus did by coming to earth, and that is why he is God. He is the God above every other God for that reason, because what he did is so incredulous. It defies comprehension, it defies logic, because the creator became the created. That's what happened. He took on human flesh with the ability to be tempted to sin, but he was 100% God and 100% man, and he didn't sin. Rather, he obeyed his earthly mother and his earthly father, and he didn't ever usurp the authority of God the Father by showing his identity until the day he was baptized and started his earthly ministry. Jesus was small enough to be a preborn, and he was big enough to hold the whole universe in his hands. He embraced the plans that the Godhead planned before the world began, and knowing his fate, 
he came anyway. And you have to wonder, would anyone else do the same? If you knew before you came that your death was going to be torture, that you were going to be innocent of what you were killed for, would you continue on the same path knowing that the ones you came for, even your closest companions, would reject you and turn on you? He died alone. How would you feel if God told you that you were going to bear his son? You have a fiance, you have parents, and you have to tell them that you're pregnant. And you have to tell your fiance that he's not the father. You can imagine the shame as the village whispered about Mary. Imagine the weight of knowing though that you're carrying the son of God because she believed right away that this was true. And you hope that you don't mess up that child with the pregnancy and all the different stresses of that. So let's talk about Mary, the mother of Jesus. Thousands of paintings, drawings, statues, and even living manger scenes portray Mary, the mother of Jesus, at the time of Jesus' birth. However, most of them portray her as a young woman in her 20s. And to be sure, she was a very remarkable woman at this time, but one thing she truly understood was what it meant to sacrifice for the sake of doing God's will, an example her son Jesus noted and would later follow. Because apparently no one at that time, including herself, was expecting the Messiah to be born of a virgin. And that is why she asked the angel Gabriel, how am I going to bear the Messiah? when I'm not married and I'm not sexually active, Luke 1.34. And why Joseph decided about the whole divorce issue and why years later the religious leaders still thought Jesus was a child born to an unwed mother, a single mother, born of fornication in John 8.41, Mary knew that accepting this pregnancy from God was going to cause turmoil and pain, not just for her, her loved ones, but for Jesus, but she accepted. God asked her to do it, and she said, Behold, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Luke 1.38. That is astounding for anyone who can imagine an angel showing up and asking you to bear the Son of God, God, in a pregnancy without sex, you can imagine how everyone would think you were a lunatic, but she just accepted because she, that was her relationship with God. One very remarkable thing about Mary is that she was almost certainly 12 to 14 years old when the angel Gabriel appeared to her. We know this because the common custom at that time was for girls to marry early and about that age. And the Bible never gives Mary's age when she got pregnant or when she gave birth. And that is because when something happened that was common in culture, nothing was said about it. Women married early because it was they who bore the children, who continued the family line and provided economic strength and physical protection for the family, and it was generally desirable to have many children. Furthermore, lots of children died young and many women died during childbirth. We know from Matthew and Luke that Mary was a virgin, had never been married before, so her marriage age would have been set by what was commonly the custom. And also, as was Mary, she had a large family with at least seven children. Her male children were Jesus, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, not the Judas, the betrayer. And she had at least two daughters, for Jesus had sisters as well as brothers, according to Matthew 13, 55, and 56. And now put yourself in Joseph's shoes. How would you feel if your fiancé the one you love, comes to you and says she's pregnant, and you know that the baby is not yours. So you can imagine the betrayal, rejection, and the heartbreak of Joseph based on wrong conclusions that he drew about Mary 
because your fiance is telling you, I'm pregnant, it's not your child, it's God's child. Imagine anyone else getting that news and not drawing wrong conclusions. But God sent an angel to straighten things out for Joseph as well. And this is what we know about Joseph. He was best known as the husband of Mary and the earthly father of Jesus, as found in the New Testament books of Matthew and Luke. In these times, boys also married early, but somewhat later than girls. Jewish boys were expected to marry at 16 or 17. Similarly, in the Roman world, the age at which a Roman boy discarded the white toga with a red border, the symbol of youth, and wore a pure white toga of a Roman man and citizen was generally between 14 and 17. So just how old Joseph was when he married Mary is not as easily determined as Mary's age because although men customarily married in their mid to late teens, for a number of reasons they sometimes married later. And it's often assumed that Joseph married late in his life because it is almost certain that he was he did not live at the time that Jesus started his ministry. He had already died by then. We draw that conclusion from a number of biblical records in which Joseph was conspicuously absent, culturally speaking. And one is when Jesus moved his headquarters to Capernaum, his mother and brothers came, but not his father, John 2.12. Even more significant is that while on the cross, Jesus instructed the Apostle John to take care of his mother and told Mary to treat John as a son, which would never have occurred if Joseph had been alive. However, the fact that Joseph was dead by the time Jesus was 30 does not necessarily mean Joseph was much older when he got married, because many people died young from accidents and disease. Joseph was a man of strong beliefs. He not only strived to do what was right, but also to do it in the right way. When he betrothed Mary, and then she came to him with news that she was pregnant, he knew that child was not his. He decided he would break the engagement, but determined to do it in such a way that it would not bring shame to Mary. Here's the woman who's telling him she's pregnant by someone else, God. It's not his child, and he's trying to protect her. He's still trying to protect her. He wanted to be just, acting fairly, and he wanted to remain loving. He had great respect for Mary's character, but her story of being miraculously impregnated by God's Holy Spirit was very difficult for him to believe. And during this time of consideration, he was visited by a messenger from God confirming that Mary was telling the truth and convinced Joseph that Mary had not been unfaithful to him. God instructed Joseph to marry this young woman and to honor her virginity until the baby was born so that Jesus truly would be born of a virgin. And Joseph obeyed the Lord. And this had to have been initially very difficult for Joseph to reconcile in his natural mind. But Joseph had to be a very spiritual and faithful man with great integrity. It is not known how long Joseph was in the life of Jesus, but he realized from the moment of the heavenly visit that Jesus was definitely very special. And the last time Joseph was mentioned in the Bible was when Jesus was 12 years old. And we can assume that being the honorable man that he was, Joseph fulfilled the role of an earthly father to the best of his ability with all the love any man could give a son. Joseph was given and fulfilled the role of protector, provider, and teacher, raising the young boy without any further reservation. God provided Joseph with assurance, strength, and the abilities of leadership to raise the child who was brought to earth to be the savior of the world. Kenneth Bailey is a New Testament scholar who spent 40 years living and teaching in the Middle East. And in his book, Jesus Through the Middle Eastern Eyes by InterVarsity, he helps us better understand the context in which Jesus lived and taught and was born in Bethlehem. He reminds us that Luke 2.6 tells us that while Joseph and Mary were in Bethlehem, Jesus was born. 
but at no point does it say the birth occurred as soon as they arrived. So there's no reason to think the couple hadn't been in town for a day or longer before the birth. Bailey says that some of the traditional images we now hold come from a third century fictionalized account called the Proto-Evangelium of James, written by someone who apparently did not know Jewish tradition or Palestinian geography. In fact, Bailey says, the account in Luke fits neatly with the more likely location of Jesus' birth, the simple home of one of Joseph's relatives. Unlike the wealthy who had separate stables for their animals, common people had homes with one or two rooms, one reserved for guests, and the main room was one where the entire family cooked, ate, slept, and lived. At the end of the room was an area either a few feet lower than the rest of the floor or blocked off with heavy timber, and each night into that area, the family cow, donkey, or a few sheep would be driven. The next morning, the animals would be put back out in an outer courtyard and the area would be cleaned. The same kind of arrangements are implied in other biblical references in 1 Samuel 28:24, Judges 11:29 through 40, and Luke 13:15. The mangers were dug out of the floor through mangers for, che for sheep were sometimes made of wood and placed nearby. Such feeding areas for animals are still common in the Middle Eastern villages into the modern area. But that is, if that's the case, what does Luke 2.7 mean when it says there was no room in the inn? The Greek word usually translated in is Catalima, which is which is not the term for a commercial inn, this was simply a place to stay word, and was likely used here to refer to the guest room of the house. It's the same word Jesus uses in Luke 22, 10 through 12, when he sends the disciples to find the upper guest room where he was to share the Passover with the disciples. So in Luke 2, 7, we're told that Jesus was laid in the manger because the guest room was already occupied. So when the shepherds heard the announcement that the baby would be found in a manger, they would have understood that this was a normal peasant home like their own. This was their sign, a sign for lowly shepherds. Bailey says, looking at the story in this light strips away layers of interpretive mythology that has been built up around this story. Jesus was likely born in a simple two-room village home, such as the Middle East has known for at least 3,000 years. And yes, we must rewrite our Christmas plays, but in rewriting them, the story is enriched, not cheapened. The story is full of one crazy event after another, and here's another interesting part of this story. A careful analysis of scripture clearly indicates that December 25th could not be the date of Christ's birth. And here are two reasons. First, we know that shepherds were in the fields watching their flocks at the time of Jesus' birth, according to Luke 2, 7 through 8. Shepherds were not in the fields during December. According to Celebrations, the complete book of American holidays, Luke's account suggests that Jesus may have been born in the summer or early fall. Since December is cold and rainy in Judea, it is likely the shepherds would have sought shelter for their flocks at night. Second, Jesus' parents came to Bethlehem to register in a Roman census according to Luke 2, 1 through 4. Such censuses were not taken in the winter when temperatures often dropped below freezing and roads were in poor condition. Taking a census under such conditions would have been self-defeating. If Jesus wasn't born on December 25, does the Bible indicate when he was born? The biblical accounts point to the fall of the year as the most likely time of Jesus' birth based on the conception and the birth of John the Baptist. Since Elizabeth, John's mother, John the Baptist, was in her sixth month of pregnancy when Jesus was conceived, according to Luke 1, 24-36, we can determine the approximate time of year Jesus was born if we know when John was born. John's father, Zacharias, was a priest serving in the Jerusalem temple during the course of Abijah. Historical calculations indicate this course of service corresponded to June 13 through 19 in that year. And it was during this time of temple service that Zacharias learned that he and his wife Elizabeth would have a child. 
After he completed his service and traveled home, Elizabeth conceived, and assuming John's conception took place near the end of June, adding nine months brings us to the end of March as the most likely time of John's birth. Adding another six months, the differences in ages between John and Jesus, that brings us to the end of September as the likely time of Jesus' birth. Although it is difficult to determine the first time anyone celebrated December 25th as Christmas Day, historians are in general agreement that it was sometime during the 4th century. This is an amazingly late date. Christmas was not observed in Rome, the capital of the Roman Empire, until about 300 years after Christ's death. Its origins cannot be traced back to either teachings or practices of the earliest Christians. Now, how would you feel on an ordinary night at work taking care of your sheep if an angel of the Lord showed up and says, drop what you're doing and go? And you can imagine the fear of such a supernatural event followed by the doubt that creeps in to say, did I just make that up? What about leaving the sheep, which are your sole source of income, and sense the wonder, fear, uncertainty, and hope of the shepherds as they come to meet their Savior? So about the shepherds, an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord was shining around him, them. And the, the shepherds were very afraid, it says. The angel says, don't be afraid. I have some very good news for you, news that will make everyone happy. Today, your savior was born in David's town. He is Christ the Lord, Luke 2, 9 through 11. Why was heaven's glory revealed to a bunch of nobodies in the middle of nowhere. While shepherds had once been held high in esteem among God's people, they had become unwanted, left out, and pushed to the side. They slept on the ground. They did not live in cities. Their jobs made them little or no money. They came from the lower rung of society, and shepherds were so yesterday and so not today in Jesus' world. So why was heaven's glory revealed to this unwanted and forgotten group. There are several possible technical, theological, and historical reasons for that. One, these were Bethlehem shepherds, the shepherds who raised the sheep, offered as sacrifices at Passover. So even in Jesus' birth, we are reminded of Jesus' sacrificial death. Also, Abraham, Moses, and David were all shepherds, and God made great promises to them about deliverance and a Messiah. So now God is showing he honors his promises by announcing the coming of the Christ, the Messiah, to shepherds first. The image of a shepherd is the image Jesus chooses to use for his example of a leader, one who pastors, one who shepherds his sheep, and one who is willing to lay down his life for his sheep. And while these reasons are important, it is believed that there are other very important reasons why God announced Jesus' birth first to shepherds. God is frequently identified as the loving, tender shepherd of his people. Many references to that in the Bible. Jesus identifies himself as the good shepherd, John 10, 1 through 18. God wants us to know that he knows us, cares for us, and will never abandon us. He longs to bless us and make our lives full. He wants us in his presence and will deal with us lovingly and tenderly. So when the glory of Christ's birth is announced, it is announced to shepherds to remind us of our shepherd and the good shepherd and how much they love us. Shepherds were despised. They were unwanted. They lived far from the busy lives of most people of their day. They were not important, not personally, politically, or economically. And if God chose to reveal his glory to them first, then the King of Glory is making an important statement to each one of us personally. What if you were one of the servants in the entourage of the Magi? You're following your master who is basing his journey on a star. And it's not a short journey. It was weeks, months, and maybe even years before they arrived at their destination. How long would you keep walking to a place you don't even no, to meet a person that no one else seems to know about, only with a star as a guide. And the story of the Magi goes something like this. After Jesus was born, wise men came to look for him, probably from an area which is now in either Iraq, Iran, Saudi Arabia, or Yemen. 
although they are often called the three kings, the Bible does not say how many there were or that they were kings. One theory is that they might have been kings of the Yemen, as during this time the kings of Yemen were Jews. Three is only a guess because they brought three gifts, but however many of them there were, they probably would have had many more servants with them. They were definitely men of learning. They were certainly men of great learning. The word magi comes from the Greek word magos, or magos, where the English word magic comes from. This was a title given to priests in the sect of the ancient Persian religion such as Zoroastrianism. Today we call them astrologers. Back then, astronomy and astrology were part of the same overall study and science that went hand in hand with each other. The Magi would have followed the patterns of the stars religiously. They would have also probably been very rich and held in very high esteem in their society and by people who weren't from their country or, or religion. They had seen an unusual new star in the sky and knew that it told of the birth of a special king. No one really knows what the new star in the sky was. There are many theories about comets, supernovas, a conjunction of planets, or something supernatural. Herod asked the wise men to find Jesus and tell him where he was, not so he could go worship him, as he said, but so he could go kill him. He thought that Jesus sounded like a new king that would come and take his power away from him. Herod was the king of that time. When the wise men found Jesus and Mary, they would have been living in a normal house in Bethlehem because by this time, Jesus would have been aged between one and two years old. Then they gave their gifts to him, and the gifts seemed quite strange to give a baby, but Christians believe that they had the following meanings. Gold is associated with kings, and Christians believe that Jesus is the king of kings. Frankincense is sometimes used in worship in churches and showed that people worship Jesus. Myrrh is a perfume that is put on dead bodies to make them smell nice and showed that Jesus would suffer and die. The gifts are also things that come from east of Israel in Arabia and when they were about to go tell Herod where Jesus was, they were warned in a dream not to do that so Herod could not carry out the horrible plan he had made to kill Jesus. Here is another account of the Magi. The Magi were wise men from the east who traveled a great distance to visit and worship Jesus when Jesus was born. Matthew 2, 1 through 12 tells us the story of the Magi. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all of Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come the ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced and with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. Remember, he was one to two years old, and these are great kings themselves. They presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then being divinely warned in a dream that they would not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. The Magi demonstrated a magnificent hunger for God in this passage, and that is as clearly stated, we can see the heart of the Magi was to worship God. And here's what we can immediately notice about the heart of the Magi. 
the Magi studied the things of God. That is how they knew that Christ had been born. That is how they understood that the star was leading them to the Christ child. These wise men traveled a long distance and went to great effort and personal expense to see him. Their dedication is evident by the efforts they made to see him. Lastly, when they did see him, they worshiped him. They fell down and worshiped him, a small child, and brought him sacrificial gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. These were very costly gifts worthy of a king. They were sacrificial offerings. And although every person's sacrifice looks different, the point is they gave their absolute best to Jesus. They recognized who he was when he was not even two years old. The first thing to understand about that account is that it did not occur on the night of Jesus' birth, no matter how many times you've seen nativity scenes that show they were present. They were not. Their entry into Christ's life occurred quite a while later, most likely when Jesus was a young child. Regardless of when they arrived, the color and meaning they add to the person of Jesus is very powerful, which is why Matthew included them in his biography of Christ. Who were the Magi? In short, they were king makers. They were the heavyweights of the day. The ancient historian Herodotus tells us the Magi originated from the Medes and functioned as priests in their pagan rituals. From the Babylonian to the Roman empires, the Magi were revered and held a place of tremendous significance in the Orient. They became the key people in ancient governments and during the four world empires, the Magi served in a powerfully influential capacity as advisors to the royalty in the East, consequently earning the reputation of being wise men. The law of the Medes and the Persians was the code of the scientific and religious discipline of the Magi, and it was required instruction for anyone wishing to be a monarch in Persia. No Persian was able to become a king until they mastered the scientific and religious discipline of the Magi. Only then could they be crowned by them. In addition to overseeing the kingly office, the Magi ran the judicial branch of the government as well. The royal bench of judges were chosen by the Magi. With this kind of leverage, the Magi of the massive Medo-Persian Empire were able to control essentially the entire known world of the Orient. No wonder Herod panicked when these guys showed up one day to crown someone they called the King of the Jews. Roman, Rome was scared silly of the Magi and their Eastern Empire, and at the time of Christ there was a ruling body called the Megistanes, similar in function to the United States Senate. It was composed of Magi who had the absolute right of choice to select a king. The Magi had problems with their current ruler who had been deposed and wanting to fight Rome with a new monarch, they were on the hunt for a new king for the Eastern Empire. With Rome's current leadership in doubt at the time, the Parthians were aware that this would be the ideal time to bring about an Eastern war against the West. So here came the Magi down Main Street in Jerusalem seeking their new king, one whom Bible scholars say they had learned about from the prophet Daniel. Our common representation of the Magi arriving on three camels is a far cry from the reality. Instead, there were more in number and likely traveling in full force with all of their oriental pageantry, riding Persian steeds rather than camels. And with them, historians estimate there could have been about a thousand mounted Persian cavalrymen acting as bodyguards. That's some serious shock and awe compared to what we think is three men on camels. So no wonder this is why Matthew says, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all of Jerusalem with him in Matthew 2, 3. The Greek word for troubled is terasso, which conveys a violent shaking and turmoil. One can only imagine Herod's expression, the man who was granted the exact title King of the Jews years earlier by Anthony and Octavian, looking out at the Magi who had come to crown the King of the Jews. The head game the Magi were playing with Herod ran its course and concluded when they, lo 
located Jesus, who Matthew tells us they worshipped, indicating that their mission may not have been purely political. The Bible doesn't tell us anything more about the Magi's purpose in the life of Christ other than they headed back to their country, tricking Herod, who attempted to find and murder the future king by killing all of the male children, two years old and younger, in the Bethlehem region. That's how serious he was about killing Jesus. Isn't it interesting to note that some of the first people in the world to recognize the arrival of the Jewish king of kings were Gentiles and not Jews? And perhaps it's a subtle statement about Jesus uniting both in his church body. Plus, it may also speak to the upcoming rejection of him that John records. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. In any event, while Israel and Rome may have done their best to stop Christ from being king, God declared his son's royal present by bringing the mighty kingmakers, the Magi, from Persia to acknowledge that he was the king. The story of the Magi is a powerful reminder that not only is Jesus Savior, but he is king. He is king. Something referenced in a stanza contained in John Henry Hopkins' famous Christmas carol, We Three Kings. Born a king in Bethlehem's plain, gold I bring to crown him again. King forever, ceasing never, over us all to reign. The Gospel of Matthew tells us that after the wise men had started back home, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. We don't know exactly when to date this happened historically. It was, however, no more than two years after Jesus was born because Herod had tried to kill Jesus by slaying all of the baby boys who had been born in Bethlehem in the past two years, based on when the wise men told him they first saw the star. And since, according to the Gospel of Luke, Jesus was born around the time of the first census that took place while Curanius was governor of Syria, his birth occurred sometime between 6 BC and 4 BC, even though the AD dating is supposed to begin with the birth of Christ. It wasn't calculated correctly in the first place, and so it actually begins a little way into his lifetime. We have a better idea of when the sojourn in Egypt ended. The Gospel of Matthew also tells us that after Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up! Take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel, for those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. Herod died in 4 BC. So depending on when Jesus was born, the journey to Egypt lasted no more than two years and perhaps as little as weeks or months. It seems that the most likely scenario is that Jesus was born around 6 BC. The wise men, by their own account, arrived in Jerusalem two years later in 4 BC. And in that same year, Joseph, Mary, and Jesus fled to Egypt, Herod died, and they returned. So the length of their sojourn in Egypt was probably about a few months. The joy of this season is that with each twist and turn in the story, God finds people who choose to live from their spirit. That's like the most powerful thing I've just read. They all in this, all the key players lived by the Spirit and followed when they were challenged to believe what they have not seen and do what they have never done. Nobody was going to believe them. They were going to look crazy doing what they were doing. But that is exactly how it is today. God is going to show up for people who live by the Spirit. They don't plan, schedule, reason. They don't follow Jesus according to planning meetings, according to um, all the different um, assemblies of learning how to build a ministry. 
They live by the Spirit. And that is the adventure that God is calling each of us to live today. And I am dismayed over how few have been available to us to teach us how to do that because when you come to Christ in a miracle which was my story I am dying of a overdose that definitely should have cost me my life and I'm not in a hospital to be saved but Jesus himself shows up at the request of a woman praying for me and I am completely healed instantly in my mind my spirit is alive I didn't even have a spirit before and my body is healed from many many things and I am free from all addictions that I had which were many and chronic I'd had them a long time my mind was destroyed I know from the start how God wants to show up nobody can talk me out of what happened anyone who knew me wouldn't even try but this is the life that God has called me to is to believe for the supernatural to learn to walk in the spirit not according to my mind not according to somebody else's mind not according to a ministry plan he wanted me to follow him that's all he's ever done is follow me and I get caught in all these different paths because people think she's super passionate we need her energy and then I get pulled into some kind of a plan and then God has to literally yank me out and say follow me and so it's really hard when you don't know exactly how to do that because every time I think I am doing it I get pulled into meetings and plans and um, and then I find out that's not following Jesus and so I'm grateful for the last few years because it has felt like crazy making, but this story is encouraging because this is exactly what happens when you determine to follow Jesus and you pull away from organized religion to follow Jesus. And then when you start doing that, then you get to hear the voice of God literally speaking and saying, do this don't do that watch out for this um, this has been our story for the last four years it's been absolutely incredulous and so this story is very encouraging to me because this is what God wants us to do all of us who claim to be his he has gone to great lengths awesome outrageous lengths to give us a perfect gift and the only right response is to give him the same complete our complete worship our complete abandon and that is what Mary Joseph the shepherds and the magi all did they all did that they abandoned all of their own thoughts to follow King Jesus. Jesus came for me. He came for each person. He says, I'm not too low, even though by all world standards, I had sunk to the most disgusting, despicable low possible. I, I can tell you how low it was, but I know that it was actually lower. It was disgustingly low. I wasn't too insignificant for him. I wasn't too unimportant. I wasn't too powerless. I wasn't forgotten by him. I wasn't too anything for God to love me, to find me, and to heal me in the last moment. 
that I would have had before going to hell for eternity. There's generally at this point two deaths a week that we're notified of that we know them. There's just a terrible state out there of fentanyl that is killing many and not even that there are famous people who have privilege all power to get to the very best care who are dying young and tragically and i remember the year that i was born again a few months later i remember um River Phoenix died of a drug overdose out in LA and that was he was a rising star at the time that I had become saved and was a to all appearances someone who lived a clean life unlike most of us I was absolutely shocked when River Phoenix was allowed to die of a drug overdose a violent death in front of his brother and his friends out on a public sidewalk I never could rationalize that in my mind because I thought now why would God have not just shown up for him and touched him and healed him because the whole world would have seen the existence of God at that moment God could have been immediately on blast right there Instead, in the same year, probably about the same age, he comes to me, one who most people wished would just die and get out of the way because I brought nothing but chaos and, and pain everywhere I showed up. But I'm the one that he chose to save. And I'll never understand why that is, that he did that. But this story shows he's always done that. He comes to the one no one else thinks should get that and gives them the most. And oddly, that's who I became as a Christian person. I have no desire to be known. I have no desire to be famous I have no desire to be rich I have no desire to be wanted I just want to follow Jesus I want to see Jesus heal people I want to see Jesus show up and do just supernatural things that's all I want and people think I'm a lunatic because I should want to be famous I should want to be rich I should want something but I don't because he came to me and healed me when I knew I should be in hell. I only want to see Jesus. That's all I've ever wanted. That's all I want at this point. And Jesus comes to people that no one else values. And that's where you're going to see the great things happen i've got 30 years of experience now with him and i will continue to stay amongst the broken the forgotten those who have been pushed out shoved out judged that's where i'm going to stay because that's where jesus is going to do great things so when we hear all the christmas songs and we see all these nativity scenes we read all the birth stories we should be reminded of one thing. God is crazy about us. He longs to have us in his presence. He wants to tenderly care for us. He says he will never leave us or forsake us if we will come to him and choose to follow Jesus. He won't leave us. If we wander from him, he'll come looking for us. But why would we do that? In Jesus, God laid down his life for me to bring me back to his family and then one day bring me back to him to live with him forever.
that's the part of the story that is most important. So you may feel forgotten, but God has never stopped paying attention to you. You can know that he loves you, not only because he's paying attention, but also because he took the initiative to save you. We were all lost. This world by us was handed over to the enemy. God came to make a way for us to come back to him. We weren't born back with him. We have to come back to him. Everyone is not a child of God. You come to him and you become a child of God. If you don't do that, you are not a child of God. And in the end, you will not live forever with him. Love is not just words. It is acting on behalf of others. It is making someone else's problem your own. And that's exactly what God did at Christmas. Jesus came at Christmas to die for me on the cross. And that is the greatest example of love possible is to give your life. And he was God. When Jesus came to earth, God was showing his love in the most amazing way. It's as if he's saying, I see you. I'm going to take care of all of your problems. I'm going to take them on myself. I'm sending my only, my beloved son to live a perfect life and then die in your place for all of your sin. That's how much I love you. God held nothing back at Christmas through Jesus. He showered love on us. But very few are going to choose him. Very few, the Bible says, because people want the darkness. They want their freedom. They want to do what they want to do. They do not want to live in the spirit. They want to live according to their own mind, according to their own feelings. They want that more. They don't want this Jesus. I have to ask, why wouldn't we choose him when you know this story? Why wouldn't we choose him? Why would we leave him if he says, if you wander, he does come for us. But why? Why would we wander away from Jesus? Why would we hurt him? Why would we make him come find us in that same trash heap that he came and dug us out of, carefully wiped us off, dressed us like a prince or a princess put us in a palace and then we run back and dig a big hole in the trash heap and say I hope he comes and finds me because I'm not gonna find my way out of this trash heap I sort of like it here it's insane what we do I would say let's honor Jesus this week not just today every day but especially this week be loud about Jesus. This isn't just a baby in a manger story. This is an incredible love story. And this is what Jesus has, he has given us this example of, I gave up everything for you. We have nothing to give up for him, but we should give up everything for him. We should worship Jesus with every thought, with every action, we should stop planning. We should just stop planning how to be a good Christian. And we should follow Jesus. We should give him our loyalty. We should give him our complete life. Jesus, you are hard to capture in words. It's very hard to capture you in words. But I do know, because I am I know how insane I was. I know how completely ugh, it's hard to comprehend even now with the way my mind is that I stay fixed on you. My brain can't stay fixed for five seconds on anything else, but you are so worth my life. The one I don't deserve to have at this point. Help me to be faithful help me to represent you even a tiny bit as amazing as you are help me to never work on the side of the enemy and cause harm to what you are trying to show us today in this world help us to not 
serve anything on this earth but to keep our focus on the kingdom to come. Help us to stay aware that we are travelers here. This is not our home. And help those who feel this is their home to realize they better come to repentance or they also will find in the end that they missed it. This is not our home if we belong to you. So I ask that you show up whichever way you have to, to shake this world to reality so that people will stop fixating and obsessing about this life and they will put their eyes on eternity and that they will look at those around them who are not ready to meet you and do whatever it takes for them to be ready for eternity because we know we're turning a corner right now and it's going to be hard and then you're coming back have your way in us forgive us for our sin help us Jesus to be the brightest flaming light we can be for you right now and I ask for a revival to start even this year that you would pour out your spirit that people would be unable to resist you that they cannot continue to live obsessed with their own life you will cause them to despise it so that they will choose you whatever it takes Jesus I ask that you bring those we love and those you love to their senses and to you before it's too late I ask this all in Jesus name Amen